I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst for ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer. And on this very special edition of Coffee with Lynette, I have my good friend Wolf Richter back, and I'm so happy to have him here. He, he publishes Wolf Street, where you will find in-depth writings on economics, business, financial is issues, and lots of the garbage that goes on in Washington and Wall Street. And we're going to be talking about a lot of that today. But you guys know that I think this man is absolutely brilliant, insightful, and very, very understandable. And you all know that I utilize a lot of his work. So I'm so glad to have you back, Wolf. Thank you Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me back, Lynette. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, we have a lot of things to talk about, but you recently did a, a, a piece on Maine and America tax plan that calls for a minimum tax for corporations. And I'd like you to explain that. And also globally, it looks like they're looking for a minimum global tax. Can you address that for us, please? I don't generally get into tax policies, yeah, but uh, right. I think that a, uh, a tax on reported earnings, uh, so the, a tax based on what corporations tell their uh, uh, investors would be the appropriate uh, way to go. And so we have two systems now, one would be financial reporting, and so under the generally accepted accounting principles, and so in companies inflate their earnings, uh, the best they can. And then on the tax side, they have a separate reporting, yeah, tax, uh, um, tax accounting and under the IRS rules. And so they minimize the earnings and create losses and you have that. So uh, the easiest way to do this is to, to tax uh, reported earnings uh, as they, yeah, the same, the same way that investors see it. And, and, uh, um, and there, there was some, um, uh, uh, um, some movement in the Treasury Department under Yellen now to to uh, include a minimum tax uh, based on these issues, um, and, and that only is goes goes a small step towards that and only impacts the largest corporations, but it leaves the corporate tax code intact. In and I say throw out the corporate tax code, switch everything over to taxing based on what companies report to investors, and. Um, you, you won't even have to audit anything because they will maximize their, their reported profits. You know, they're not going to minimize anything. So um, you can throw out your, your, audio, your, your audit staff and uh, just slap your minimum tax on uh, the amount that report to investors. And, and uh, that should work very well. Now, Yellen did approach that a little bit uh, with a half step, but I don't know that it will go anywhere. That, yeah, that was my next question. Do you think that's going, I mean, with all the lobbying that goes on, in yeah. Washington, yeah, it's very difficult to uh, uh, to to increase corporate taxes in Washington, and and the corporate tax code is completely unfair because some small companies pay a, a fairly large portion of their income in taxes, and some very complicated large global companies uh, with huge multi-billion-dollar profits pay no taxes at all, and so that's really the unfairness of it all. You you want to change that. You want to make it fairer, and you know that the total amount to be raised in taxes that's a political decision. But at least it should be fair. And right now, the corporate tax code is the is the epitome of unfairness. Well, what do you think about trying to take this global as well? I mean, they got that huge tax break just a few years ago, and they were allowed to basically bring all of this these profits home for essentially I, nothing. I, I think it's a good idea to uh, to have a minimum uh, global tax, uh, <laughs> but you know you would have to get every country in, on earth uh, uh, to, to, to fall in line, and Ireland has already come out and said, no, we're not going to do that. that right. They want to retain, and, and the other ta tax shoulders are likely the same, so the Cayman Islands and others, so that allows U.S. companies to set up offshore entities and route different uh, revenues and expenses through those entities, thereby uh, lowering the taxable U.S. profits. And and you know this is a game that I cannot play with my little company. You know I right. have to pay uh, the the corporate tax uh, in the United States. I don't have a setup in the Cayman Islands or an island uh, to to do that. And and so I I think it would be a good idea to to bring some fairness uh, to the tax code. Well. 
It could be a great idea too, but I'm not sure that they're going to be able to, you know, really pull that off. Uh, but it was really interesting watching the CEOs at the banks in front of the Senate committee this week. That's been really interesting and having them justify the 900 to 1 salaries that the CEOs get versus the the bottom rung. And that kind of takes us to the wealth tax or the wealth effect rather is really what I was talking about. And you did an article on that recently too. Could you explain what that is for, for our viewers and the impact of their goal on the wealth effect? Yeah, so uh, the wealth effect is, so I'm putting that in quotation marks because that's right. actually the technical term uh, that is being used by the Federal Reserve. And, and uh, Janet Yellen, when she was still uh, the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, uh, wrote papers on it. And then Ben Bernanke, uh, when he was chairman at the Fed, uh, wrote a Washington editorial explaining it. So this is official policy, uh, was official policy at the Federal Reserve. It means that um, you make the, the, meaning the Fed will make the wealthy wealthier through its monetary policy and uh, that this uh, wealth will then in part trickle down and boost the overall economy. So the wealth wealthy will get wealthier and they will spend some of this extra wealth and they buy, you know, bigger homes and bigger cars and, and go to restaurants more often or whatever. And, and, um, and then this wealth, some of this wealth uh, spreads around. So that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the theory behind it. And um, of course, this has now generated uh, a horrendous wealth uh, disparity uh, between the 1% or really the 0.1% and and much of the rest of the population. Now, I'm not talking about the, the, the 50%, the lower 50%. I'm talking like the lower 80%. Yeah. Right. So this has created a huge concentration of wealth at the very, very top and, uh, and has made everybody else's life a lot more expensive. And so now the Fed, the, the, the new Fed under and the Powell has stepped away from calling it the wealth effect. Now they're 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 trying to promote this idea of of income equality and you know uh, whatever and, and global warming and other things that they're getting into now. They're not mentioning the wealth effect anymore because it has blown up into their faces now and and um, and they're aware they're fully aware of the wealth disparity data. The, the Federal Reserve publishes it every every quarter now and, and I report on it. So it is horrendous and it's just spiking right now that, that disparity is spiking. And um, you know that the lower levels make a thousand dollars more per year and the upper levels make you know five hundred million dollars more a year. So that's that just increases the disparity. And the Fed's fully aware of that. Yeah, but doesn't that lead to, you know, protests and loss of confidence and really for the masses it's the confidence that's keeping this whole game going, isn't it? Yeah, and I think a lot of the frustration that you have all over the place, so this is on the political spectrum on the left, on the right, and in the middle, right. uh, comes from that uh, wealth disparity and, and also from the income is disparity. It's very difficult for people uh, in the lower 50, 60 percent to, to, to work things out in this economy, and and they get very frustrated. They don't see much of a future, and, and they run into all these problems, and and yeah, there's a huge amount of frustration out there. And I completely get that. I mean, I, I look at, right. at what's going on and I'm, I totally get that. I mean, the amount of frustration out there is enormous and, and the Fed is just making it worse. And, and it's dangerous because right. in order for them to stay in power, they require the public to have confidence in them. And this seems to actually be doing just the opposite. So that, do you think that's going to lead us to UBI? I mean, give these, give that lower, well, look at what they're doing with the stimulus. I mean, income has jumped for that lower level. Yeah. It, it's actually been really interesting because I do a lot of work with um, a school near here, a homeless school. And, you know, I try and do something every month with them. And we called up, do you need food? They're going into the summer. And he said, it's the most amazing thing. Their pantry has never been more full because people haven't been coming and utilizing it as much. 
Now, he thinks that might change in the fall, but he actually said, we don't need any food right now. That was pretty amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, fiscal policy. Yeah, so uh, we've, yes. we've seen the government uh, throw out, it, throw into the into the economy, huge amounts of money in all kinds of ways through extra unemployment benefits and the stimulus payments and 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 all these other things. And so that is not the Fed, you know, that's the stimulus. Too uh, true, but you know, I, I kind of see them, I hate to say this, but it's true. They're kind of like one, aren't they working together? Yeah, the Fed's <laughs> certainly enabling that by by uh, buying uh, the government debt, you know, and, and creating right. a, a low interest rate environment. So the, the Fed is definitely enabling that, that's With, for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. And all the QE that's been pumped into this system, I mean, it's enormous, but it seems to be having some repercussions in the repo market. There's almost too much liquidity sloshing around. And you've recently addressed that as well. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, now the, the, the Fed is actually uh, <laughs> taking liquidity out of the market uh, in large amounts. You know, it's, it's over $400 billion now. Um, and so on, with one hand, it's adding liquidity through QE. On the, with the other hand, it's taking liquidity out. It could, of course, say, well, we're going to stop QE. We could uh, unwind the balance sheet. That would accomplish the same thing. But it promised that it uh, will you know, be very slow and deliberate in its tapering discussions and yada, yada, yada. So it backed itself into a corner. It can't do that. And there's so much liquidity out there that uh, uh, some of the, the repo rates have dropped below zero because there's so much demand for treasury securities. Uh, and so the, the Fed has taken in this cash, it's taken in over $400 billion in cash and handed out 400 and some billion dollars worth of uh, treasury securities. And um, yeah, this is just, uh, it's in the middle of the quarter. Sometimes that happens at the end of the quarter when banks are trying to straighten out their balance sheets. but. And now this is happening in the middle of the quarter. It's been getting bigger and bigger every day. And, and um, so this is the, 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 the whole system, the whole financial system is straining under this liquidity, this huge pile of liquidity out there. And, and it doesn't, it it's kind of doesn't know where to go anymore. And, and they've completely distorted it. And so now they're trying to mop it up that way. And, and um, we may get some pretty large amounts. Do you think it's going to work? Well, it work if for what the Feds are trying to accomplish. It's it's trying to not have to cut back its purchases uh, right. uh, too soon, you know, and it's trying to to take out some of the liquidity that way and keeping rates above zero. And um, so I think it will work in that respect, you know. But it shows that how how screwed up the whole system now is. Exactly. I mean, do you think it's an indication of the Fed losing control? It's <laughs> uh, a good question, right? I mean, yeah, so, so the the Fed can lose control, or probably doesn't have a lot of control to begin with over inflation. So that's one place where the Fed can lose control and, and may lose control. And uh, the other place is the currency. So that's related to uh, to inflation. Uh, in terms of the markets, in terms of the the repo and the reverse repo markets, and and uh, bond yields, especially short-term bond yields, I don't think that the Fed will lose control over that. It has the tools to to, to, to manipulate that, but uh, the side uh, effects are on the currency and are on inflation, and there the Fed could lose control. I mean, uh, what we're looking at right now in inflation is kind of scary in, in terms of uh, how the mindset has changed. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. talking about uh, the base effect, but you're looking at the change of mind uh, in, in the mindset. I just did an article on vehicle dealers and, and profits in new and used vehicles. I mean, prices are spiking, and not only that, but profits are spiking. So dealers are able to make extraordinary record profits, which means that consumers are willing now to pay a lot more than they used to. And that's a change of mindset. We, I just haven't seen that ever before, and, and that's completely new, and this is not temporary, and the Fed could very easily lose control uh, over over that game. Well, I think that you're right. And I, and it's in car dealerships, it's in real estate. I mean, mm -hmm. 
And we've got the mortgage moratorium that's lifting the end of June. So, and we're pretty much in June. I mean, where do you think this is really headed? Do you think that we've started the hyperinflationary event yet? Do you think we will? Uh, I know we're we're uh, kindling a pretty good amount of inflation. I don't know that it will go to hyperinflation. Uh, the thing is, once it gets, uh, it's once it threatens to go towards a double digit inflation. Uh, not yeah, even before it gets there, but the Fed will will crack down because hyperinflation or even even just a a big chunk of inflation like the heart have in Argentina where it's in the double digits for years, it's 40% per year, that kind of thing. Uh, that is devastating to an economy that that serves no one. And uh, the the parties that uh, the, uh, the Fed takes care of, they're hurt by this type of inflationary event as well. So the Fed will crack down. And it has now more tools to crack down than it had before. It can raise interest rates, but it can also unload its balance sheet. It has seven trillion dollars worth of securities on its balance sheet, and it can unload those, and that will kill demand, and it will bring inflation down most likely. You know, this is something the Fed had never had before; it never had that kind of balance sheet. So it doesn't even have to raise interest rates very high. It can just start uh, talking about unloading its its securities, and um, <laughs> financial markets will go haywire. Well, that's, and, uh, that was my next question. What do you think the impact on the financial markets is going to be? Uh, that, that's uh, uh, if the Fed has to feels like it has to go that far, uh, if it acknowledges that this is a huge problem and it needs to to step on it, um, yeah, this will be this will be very tough for the financial markets. Well, part of what you were talking about before with the people being willing to pay more for you were using used cars, but it's true for pretty much everything, isn't it? And yeah. could that not be true for inflation expectations? Yeah, and they're already coming up. Exactly. That's already happening. And uh, and the fact that they're willing to pay more uh, right now with the actual money, there's not expectations. That That's what they're willing to do right now. They did. They they, they paid more. And so this is already happening. It's a fact. It's not an expectation. So that shows that inflation expectations, as they're measured now, are probably underrated. I mean, they're not, they're not actually dealing with <laughs> Uh, the extent to which people have changed, you know, they expect more inflation and they're willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay, they were willing to pay for it last month and they're willing to do it right now. So this is happening. This is here. Do they feel like they, I mean, I think most people probably feel like they don't really have a choice about it. Do they? That's the thing. That's the mindset. So you're not voluntarily doing it. You're doing it because you, you feel like that's, I have to do it to get the car, to get the house, to, to, to get whatever, I have to, to step up and, and pay. And that's what they're doing. But this is all debt fueled. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I, I see them as between a rock and a hard place because they should be raising rates and lowering their balance sheet now. But what do you think is going to happen if they, well, I was, I was listening and uh, Williams was on ex-Fed president and he was saying he thought by the end of this year that they would start to taper bond purchases because they're still going at a pretty good clip. Yeah, that's that's kind of what they're saying, you know. So uh, obviously that could speed that up. So uh, they could bring that in. Uh, so the next meeting they're going to talk about talking about tapering and <laughs> and maybe they'll they'll that. they'll talk about. Uh, more precisely, so that would be a surprise. And then after that meeting, they could outline, you know, a, a schedule, and um, and it could happen, you know. So, uh, but meanwhile, you know, they're taking a huge amount of liquidity out of the market via the reverse repo. So, I mean, they have started that. That's a process uh, that is far stronger than tapering. Yeah, tapering. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about right. just buying a little bit less. A little bit less, yeah. So now they've taken out four hundred thirty billion dollars already. You know, that's that's like four months of uh, close to four months of uh, uh, of QE, and and that's already taken out. So uh, it could be that the tapering itself may not have any impact because they've already taken out the liquidity via the reverse repos, and much more than that. So it it uh, and maybe that's the strategy that they're trying to get the tapering. Uh, 
um, you know, under sort of get the markets not to react to tapering. And meanwhile, right. they're doing the same thing much more via their reverse repos. Hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting. If they're trying to do it in a backdoor method, I mean, Wall Street knows that they're doing it. The public wouldn't, but Wall Street. So do you think that's a lot of what's going on with, um, with the stock repurchases up again? You know, getting draining that extra cash from the corporations, dividends, special dividends, is are they maybe corporations maybe transferring the cash out of their off their balance sheets in anticipation? Because like we saw in March, you had Boeing that did that to a pretty hefty degree, and then they went in and they got you know they got bailed out. Yeah, I mean when you have trillions and trillions of liquidity suddenly show up, uh, you know, that has an impact all around and we see it. I mean, you see it in city budgets, you see it in state budgets. I mean, this liquidity is, is everywhere now. Everyone is just a float in it and companies were too. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how this will impact uh, uh, corporate balance sheets. Um, they have corporate debt is at record highs. They've borrowed a huge right. amount of money, you know, to, because of these short, in, these, uh, um, low interest rates and they're sitting on a ton of cash and they're sitting on a ton of debt. And so some of the debt that we paid those, so they took out uh, their uh, credit lines at the banks in March and April that we paid some of that, but the bond issuance has been just enormous. And, and so they're going to do something with that cash. You know, they're going to buy other companies or buy their own stocks or, or some companies just to survive, they're going to burn that cash, the airlines, the cruise uh, lines, you know, uh, some of these companies are just going to burn some of that cash and have already. Yeah, but look at their stock prices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is almost laughable how insane these markets are these days. But, you know, you also have a lot of the high flyers that have pulled back quite a bit from their highs. So what do you think? What do you think the markets are trying to tell us? Yeah, so some of the... Uh, uh, the elements were were the, the the most flagrant speculation was taking place. So some of the stocks that um, uh, that that were pumped up by a factor of ten or more in in the shortest amount of time, and uh, and that includes uh, some of the IPO stocks. It includes some of the SPACs, the EV yeah. SPACs, electric vehicle SPACs. It includes some of the real estate uh, stocks like Zillow and and Redfin and, and many others. And so these are fairly broad spectrum of companies out there now uh, whose stocks have gotten totally crushed. So they're down 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, 80 percent, some of them. And, uh, and there's a large number of them, but except they're not huge companies. So they haven't really impacted the overall indices yet. And uh, but but that's coming. So that's happened. Yeah, the, the cryptocurrencies have have uh, gotten bashed down uh, a lot. And uh, that's a sign that's also the very speculative end of the markets. So that end generally experiences the first problems and then it's on the margin and then it, it migrates towards the core of the market. And I think uh, that's kind of what it looks like to me that we're seeing some of that. So we're seeing the fraying at the at the margins and, and we'll, we'll probably be watching it as, it as it migrates more towards the core of the market. And the core of the market is for the viewers well, you know, the, the, uh, the, or... the bigger stocks, you know, mm -hmm. okay. the, the, the stocks that make the indices move. So, uh, you know, when, when you have, uh, this, you know, thousands of stocks, but there's maybe only 50 that really decide what an index does and the index like the S&P 500, you know, so it's, it's really heavily dependent on, on the biggest companies. And uh, some of them have, have come down some, you know, that's not like they've, they've been up, but um, so that will then uh, push down the overall indices. Well, we, we, you know, we talked about debt, but we also have to talk about leverage because not only are they indebted at the highest levels, they're also leveraged, which works great on the way up and it's very destructive on the way down. But can you address some of the, some of the leverage that's in the system that people just might not be aware of? 
Yeah, and the thing is about leverage is we only know a very small part. So we know uh, so-called margin debt. That's reported uh, by brokers to FINRA. You know, and that's the classic uh, margin debt that you have in your brokerage account. So you have $1,000 and you buy $1,300 worth of stock with that and you borrow that remaining $300. That's your margin debt. And so that's reported and we know that. And that has shot from record to record. It's now hit $850 billion. Yeah. The, the thing we don't know is the hidden margin debt. And it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so we hear stories about how, like in the crypto space, how uh, some of the uh, outfits out there allow uh, traders to uh, run uh, one to 100 leverage in, in, in the crypto accounts. You know? And so you see these explosive moves in the crypto space because of this margin. And a huge margin. You have a uh, hit margin uh, in in stocks and it's hedge funds and it's it's family offices such as Archegos, which blew up because of its margin. Yeah, nobody knew how much they had, and and uh, and it's insurance companies and it's 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 uh, wealthy people with with big brokerage accounts. You know that uh, that that uh, that are able to 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 borrow against the securities, which is a separate thing and not reported in margin debt. So you have all this. Uh, this additional leverage out there. And, and so when, when prices decline, that cost is for selling in highly leveraged positions like we have seen with Archegos. Archegos was fo right. forced to, to sell its, its, its holdings and that cost the underlying stocks to collapse. I mean, some of those went down 50% just like in weeks. And, uh, and so a decline in stock prices will trigger further for selling. And so it's this chain that, that you get into in, in, in the sell-off. So high margin debt doesn't predict anything except that when there is a sell-off, it's going to be a lot worse than what it would be without margin debt. I mean, that's the one thing that margin debt uh, will tell you, high leverage will tell you, when, when, when values go down, they will go down a lot faster, a lot further than they would if there were not so much leverage. Right. And, and that, so that's something to worry about in that respect. Because it's it, like we've seen in the cryptos. I mean, the bottom can just fall out, Oof, gone. <laughs> you know, get down 20 or 30 percent. Yeah, by the time you get up and look at it, and so yeah, that's that's a tough thing to go through. It is, and and part of my concern, and you mentioned Archegos, because I don't think we're done with that piece yet. But you know, a lot of that that was all about derivatives, and derivatives are all about leverage. And since 2008, the derivative world has expanded massively and it's really infiltrated all of those fiat money products like, you know, mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera. But um, an imploding stock market, we're bond market, an imploding market period is deflationary. So how do you think the Fed would deal with that, with the balance sheet? It's, it's actually, I pulled the number this morning, it's about to be over $8 trillion. It yeah. probably is now as we're sitting here speaking, because it was yeah. 7.922883. Yeah, and so the new balance sheet will come out, or maybe it's already come out uh, um, today. So. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be at $8 trillion. It is at $8 trillion practically. And, and, right. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> I mean, if there's a collapse in the markets, uh, especially in the credit markets, and that's what the Fed is primarily concerned with, is the right. credit market. So when they freeze up, when they lock up, the Fed will step in. And uh, and we know that. It, it does that without fail. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how many trillions it has to throw at it. When the credit markets freeze up, so when bonds stop trading, when companies can't borrow anymore, that kind of thing, when government uh, securities are suddenly uh, hitting a hole, that's when the when the Fed will step in for sure. And uh, so if, if that were to happen, uh, we would – so on top of all the assets the Fed already has, we, you know, it, we'll, we'll get a whole bunch more. Uh, if the sell-off is is more subdued, I think the, um, the and if the credit markets don't freeze up, I think the Fed will let it go. Yeah, I I you think they'd let the stock market go? Yeah, because yeah. that's the barometer that people really pay attention to. Yeah, well, I, I don't think uh, a twenty percent decline in the stock stock market would would make the Fed nervous at this point. No, I don't. I I agree with that. I don't think a twenty percent would. If it's down fifty percent, I think that would be a different issue. But uh, um, yeah, 
So there's a, there's a line somewhere where they get nervous when they see the stock market is triggering problems in the credit market, and and that's often the case. Um, yeah, then uh, then they're worried about that, and uh, so I, it's really hard to predict how the the Fed will will deal with these issues when they when they come, you know. But I think they would actually be relieved to see some. Uh, some of the hot air coming out of the, out yeah. of the asset prices. You know, they, they, they're not really comfortable with this. Even though they created it. I mean, they certainly know financial repression, you know, you just keep those interest rates at zero and below. And it's so funny to me to listen to the talking heads, you know, being curious as to, gee, I don't know why this is happening. It's like, oh my God. You know, but they can't really let anybody else know it, can they? So yeah. if they need to grow more credit, I mean, did you, I'm, I know you because you pay attention to everything, but uh, this recent discussion on the bigger banks giving credit cards and credit to people, well, it's actually to their own, they said it's to their clients that don't have credit. So I don't know what that means for the completely unbanked, which is really a big issue that they're trying to pull in, get everybody into the system. But what do you think that move is about? Well, I actually think it's it's not a bad move considering how the credit scores, the FICO scores have been completely corrupted by uh, the stimulus money and the extra unemployment mm -hmm. benefits and the and the moratoriums and everything. So people don't pay their rent. They don't have to pay the rent. They don't have to pay the mortgages and forbearance. Uh, they come up with deals with for, you know, to put the credit cards in forbearance. So we've, over the past year, we've had all these uh, uh, ways that people can stop making debt payments in a way that the lenders agree to. And then this is uh, considered under the credit reporting policies, mm -hmm. not a default. And so they stop making mortgage payments because the mortgage is in forbearance now, an agreement with the lender. And so they have made a mortgage payment in a year, and yet it's not considered a default, and they're not behind uh, on the mortgage. And what's even worse is that they were behind maybe 30 or 60 days on the mortgage before it went into forbearance. Then they make a deal with the lender to put the mortgage in forbearance. Now that mortgage is considered current. <laughs> even though that's, it's still behind, they still have made a payment. And so the credit scores have shot up in the United States. You know, despite the pandemic and despite people not making rent payments and mortgage payments and credit card payments, you know, the credit Small scores payments. have come down. And, and so the banks have realized we can no longer rely on those credit scores. They do not tell us anymore uh, whether uh, consumers are a high or a low uh, credit risk. And so they come up with their own solutions. You know, I, when I was in business back in the 80s, when we looked at our customers' credit worthiness, we didn't have a credit score and, and we did our research, you know, and, and we didn't deal with retail customers in that respect, but it was it was other companies, you know, we did our own research and we, we called other companies and they asked for referrals and references and did our own checking. And then we decided who, which company we're going to extend credit to. And, um, now everything is automated with credit scores and, and the credit scores are not valid anymore. They're, they're not right. good. So I think it's a good idea for banks to, to, to kind of steer away from these credit scores and come up with their own measurements. And then no, a bank knows everything you're doing, you know? So your bank knows your credit worthiness. And so maybe you've not had any credit established and uh, for whatever reason, but you have, you know, $3,000 in your checking account at all times and you get a certain amount of money in every day and, and every month and you spend a little less than that. And they, they say, yeah, we can give them a credit card. You know, they're going to be responsible. And even though your credit score may be really low, you know, so I, I think overall that's, that's a long necessary move to, to you know, to, to get away from these silly credit scores and do something that's a little bit more reasonable. And, and especially with these forbearance agreements having screwed up everything, you know, right. you really can't rely on, on, on credit scores anymore. Well, you know, I'm wondering what's gonna happen when the moratorium lifts and people still can't pay their mortgages. And I think right now, don't they have to get caught up? It's not like, well, now their normal payments start. So they're gonna have to restructure those mortgages, aren't they? 
Yeah, there's different ways to, to emerge from uh, forbearance and uh, quite a few people have already done that. So you can sell the home, for example, and take the proceeds and pay off the mortgage. And with home prices having shot up so much, you know, that's, that's not feasible and in, in many cases. Or, um, you know, maybe you have uh, gotten your job back or gotten a new job and you can make a mortgage payment. So the bank will then restructure the mortgage and uh, the payments you didn't make will be added to uh, the balance of the mortgage. And, you know, they'll, they'll, you'll make a new payment for, for the term of the loan. They may also extend the mortgage. So you may be you may have 27 years or 26 years left on the original mortgage. They may take it up to 30 years to bring the mortgage payment down. So with home prices having shot up, now everybody's eager to work this out because you know the, the asset prices back in these mortgages are, are much higher than they were a year ago. Now, yeah. during the financial crisis, during the mortgage bust, it was the opposite. You know, we had home prices plunging and people couldn't get out of their mortgages. They couldn't sell the house uh, for anywhere near what they're owed on it. Yeah, that's not the case. So um, I think what we will see is more supply on the housing market when these mortgages uh, come out of forbearance and the homes are sold. But um, I, I don't think we'll see a huge uh, spike in defaults coming uh, coming out of those uh, forbearance agreements because yeah, simply because home prices have risen so much. Now, there are some, some markets maybe where home prices haven't risen and that would be a problem but in most markets they have. And, and so I, I would expect a bigger supply coming on the market from that. And uh, as people are essentially forced to sell the homes and, uh, and that may cause some home price declines, you know, when, when that comes out. Uh, but I would not expect a spike in defaults there. But, you know, we've seen over the last three months that the buyers, the individual buyers have basically been priced out of this market. Since, mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about the price of homes mm -hmm. and it's gone into the corporate entities who mm -hmm. I guess they've got so much free money. It doesn't really matter what they're paying, does it? Yeah, it makes you wonder, you know, <laughs> and, and some of them are corporate entities. Uh, others are just individual investors, you know, and, and, uh, a lot of people are buying a second home uh, and that's really a trend now. So they're moving, they left San Francisco. So they left a condo in San Francisco or a house in San Francisco and they moved out to uh, further away areas in California or they moved to another state. And they're not selling the home in San Francisco. Yeah, they're, they're trying to ride up the boom in home prices. So they're buying a new home, but they're not selling the old one. So now they have two homes and they're riding up uh, the home price increases with both homes. And, and, you know, financially that makes, makes sense as long as it works, you can't blame them. Uh, at the same time, it takes a home off the market. And uh, this is the, this bizarre situation we have. I mean, the population did not increase in uh, 2020 in the United States, by just uh, except minimally. And right. population in California dropped in 2020. And uh, it went down by 125,000 people or something, you know, so there should be a, uh, uh, plenty of inventory uh, to sell in, in California. Yeah, but there's not because people are not selling the homes that they left. They're left behind. That will change. Yeah, it's very expensive to carry a home that nobody lives in. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you need large price increases to make that work. Uh, you have to pay a mortgage interest. You have to pay uh, insurance, taxes, uh, maintenance. Yeah, it's really expensive to, to, to do that for a long time. And unless you have house price increases, they're very significant. You know, you're you're realizing, oh, that's not a good deal. I need to I need to sell this thing. And there are no indications that we will see some of those homes come on the market uh, later this year. So, do you think that bubble is in the process of popping? I mean, it certainly is not quite popped yet, but there are shifts that are going on. Yeah, I I, I don't think uh, this will go. Uh, much further, you know, this, this is starting to have some ripple effects all around. And, and um, I mean, housing is with the data we look at, it, it lags so far behind, we don't really have any real time data on it. So, uh, but yeah, the sales are down. We, 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 we've seen now the pending sales drop today. Um, the sales are down for a lot of reasons, but inventories are coming up too. You know, we've had, uh, they're still low, but they're coming up. So you have declining sales and you've got rising inventories. Uh, so 
you know, you see that probably the, the, the peak of the craziness uh, is maybe in the past. And, and as soon as this, as these vacant homes come on the market, uh, you know, we'll see that turn quite, uh, quite quickly, I think. Think so, and and dramatically as well, or you know, there will well, be. Well, yeah, the, the housing vest last time took four years, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it takes a long time with housing. It, this is not something that that you can, uh, you, you can watch uh, on, on, on like on a daily basis. You know. <laughs> well, that's true, but you know, so much has shifted in ownership of all of this real estate, and with all of the technology and and companies like Zillow and et cetera, and different ones, different companies that'll buy your house in 24 hours and it's all automated and all of that. You know, don't you think that automation might speed up this process? I mean, we didn't really have this in 2008. Yeah. And, and that's true. And you know, the process has already sped up a lot. It used to take months to sell a house and you know, the when back when the home listing was printed on paper you know so you submit it it gets printed it gets distributed then somebody's got to look at it and then people come out and look at the house and yeah you know, it, it takes and then it takes you know it, it, a home would 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 sit four months and even in a decent market before it it, it could sell it's just, just because the the issues, you know, it took a long time to get a mortgage. I mean, everything took forever. And and now mortgage approvals are near instant. Uh, the, I mean, the, the the time frame has been really squished down, uh, even without the iBuyers. That's what you're referring to, the Zillow and, and the other companies that are they're buying, the instant buyers. You know, even before then, it was it was reduced dramatically. And and uh, uh, now with these iBuyers uh, coming in and, and essentially flipping the homes, you know, um, that will will put further downward pressure on the time it takes to to sell a home. So we'll see it a little. It, it shows up more more quickly, that's for sure. But it's still not um, instant like the stock market. You know, and when something crashes, we'll we'll see it right there. <laughs> that's right. Not, we'll have to. Uh, yeah, the housing market was crashing back during the housing bust, and people still thought it was plateauing. Just right. looking at the number, you know, because it wasn't really visible. It, I mean, the people in the industry that who are working in it realized, oh, this thing is blowing up. But just looking at the top line numbers, you know, it looked like it was plateauing and gradually rounding and no big deal, you know. And and uh, while the bottom was falling out, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in the mechanics of it. I just see such a huge shift in the real estate market. Um, and, and not just from the eye buyers, you know, but also in the ownership of it and what they intend to do with it. I mean, make us a country of renters, which is really, I mean, World Economic Forum, you know, you own nothing and you're happy. Yeah. But and that, that's, uh, yeah, renting when you when you're in a very high price market, renting is the cheaper. Yes. Sport. And and so when rents rents don't. Uh, often in a big city or in a big market, uh, rents have have trouble shooting up twenty five percent or twenty percent a year. Uh, home prices can do that, you know, but but rents may go up only two percent. And so after a while, it's really cheaper to rent a nice home and, and uh, than than to buy it. Now, one of the shifts, you know, you talk about shifts here, uh, is that homes are now serving also as an office. True. And for yes. some of us, it's already half, you know, and and. Right. and yeah, yeah, and it works great. And uh, now it's it's corporate America that's figured that out too. And and so this working from home uh, is here. And uh, many companies have hybrid models where you work part of the time at home and part of the time in the office. And so working at home, especially if you have a couple with two people working at home, you know, now you you can't really do it on the kitchen table anymore. So now you need more space, and you need to essentially invest in this office that. <laughs> corporate America made you get. And uh, so some of the shifts have to do with that. People need uh, bigger places to accommodate their their uh, their new work environments. And, and I think we're seeing some of that in the housing market. Oh, absolutely. But what do you think the impact is gonna be on the commercial real estate market? Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's completely sp split in different segments. The industrial parts of that's warehouses and fulfillment centers for e-commerce, you right. know, it's red hot. Yeah, <laughs> it's just red hot. 
and uh, you know retail, so that's malls, is in real trouble. And uh, a couple of mall REITs have already uh, filed for bankruptcy. It, it's just a lot of the shops are closed, you know, in, in, in big shopping streets in New York City and in, in San Francisco and elsewhere. Uh, they may never come back, you know, that uh, landlords have to figure out what they're going to do with them. Uh, so retail is in real trouble. Retail, uh, real estate, uh, office uh, in terms of commercial real estate uh, is now looking at major problems in that uh, the, the companies have spent years hogging office space. So they, they would mm-hmm. lease office space for future use that they didn't really need. And, and now they're cutting back the footprint and all this vacant office space that they lease is showing up on the subleased market. And the subleased markets have exploded. I mean, San Francisco, Houston is, used to be the worst uh, office market in the country uh, after the oil bust of 2015, 2016, and it continues to be the worst. But now San Francisco is right there. <laughs> <laughs> and San Francisco had a, a, an office shortage until a year and a half ago. And now it's got this enormous office glut that nobody knows what to do with. And it's, it, it's all cities, you know, it's Austin, it's Dallas, it's all cities. And now uh, New York, Chicago, I mean, you, you name them. Uh, um, you know, they, they've got this huge amount of office space. Uh, corporate America has changed the way it uses offices. Uh, the biggest companies yeah. are reducing the footprints, you know, and yeah, they're consolidating, they're moving to high quality offices from lower quality offices. So that like the highest quality office space will probably be filled. But, you know, what are you going to do with the old office towers? You know, that's a big question. And, and cities will have to struggle with that and have to figure out, convert it to housing, but that's expensive. Now you can't really do that unless the landlord goes bankrupt and you, you, a new developer buys it out of bankruptcy. Yeah. You know, it takes years to do. So this is, this is a shift we, we will look at, you know, we will deal it, we'll be dealing with for years to come what to do with all these empty older office towers. That, that could, if you can figure out what to do with it or the, that trend that's going to kick into gear, that could present an opportunity. Yeah, it, it, it's been done successfully. I mean, these these uh, conversions have been done successfully. I, I watched them do it in, in Manhattan, in the southern part of Man- in Manhattan 20 years ago. Uh, it takes a lot of money. And, you know, the thing is you, you can't generally do it when you're the, when you bought the office building as an office building because your right. cost base is high, you know. So you, you'll, you'll go bankrupt. You let the building go back to the lender. The lender sells it for cents on the dollar to a new developer and the new developer spends a whole bunch of money. Uh, you know, you got to change the permitting, you got to change everything. It real, uh, residential real estate has completely different requirements than, than commercial real estate. And you got to essentially gut the building, uh, you know, put in different plumbing, different electrical, uh, different uh, fire uh, prevention methods, all kinds of stuff, you know, windows, all different things you have to do. And so it's expensive, but I think it would be a good thing if we could uh, convert some of these towers to uh, residential use and populate uh, some of these inner cities that are really kind of dead, the, the financial districts are kind of dead uh, at night, you know, and put some people back there. And, and I think it would it would uh, uh, loosen up uh, the housing issues too. Yeah, it would. It would also probably stimulate that local economy, which is yeah, critical. It would, it would be a great thing all around. I mean, if, if you could do that, you know, and, and there's another good thing I want to point out that's working from home, you know, it's revitalizing neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so now people spend more time at home. So now these cafes are popping up. Uh, people need a place to go to, you know, instead of going to a cafe downtown, you know, they're going to a cafe in the neighborhood and, you know, close by, you know, in a commercial strip close by. So you have uh, some of the services that, uh, that are essentially in collapse mode in financial districts, they're migrating out into the neighborhoods. And, and that's a good thing, you know? So yeah. um, I, I, there's a lot, I think there'll be a lot of good coming out of these shifts, but it, it, it will take a long time to, to work out. So is there some way that you think people can position to take advantage of these shifts? I mean, like the individuals? I think it's tough, you know, um, you, you know, the, I mean, for entrepreneurs, um, if you find the right location to open your cafe, yeah, that would be an opportunity. <laughs> I did, I did a restaurant once. It's like, 
I would yeah, never I do mean, that again. You couldn't pay me enough to do it again, to tell you the that, truth. But that's yeah. the business most likely to fail. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, and but it is also a very uh, important business in in the American economy. Uh, restaurants yeah. and cafes are a huge part. They're big employers. You know, people love to go to restaurants and cafes, and uh, and so that's a big thing. And 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 they're doing right now. There's a lot of business. You know, so people are easy, eager to get out of the house and go there. So uh, so that's working. And um, you know, it, in an environment like this, I mean, if you're an individual investor, if you're not a, uh, you know, if you're a property developer, that's different, you know, but if you're a, a relatively small scale individual investor, you know, you might want to work for some stocks uh, that, um, you know, might be uh, working in that area and, you know, <laughs> companies that design and remodel office space, for example, I mean, that's come up and really? uh, because now the office space has to be changed. It's no longer the, the, the sea of desks that you saw, you know, it's, it's now meeting spaces and it's, it's a little phone booth type things. And it's, uh, you know, it, you have hot desking going on. So people take turns on the desk, they have to make appointments with the desk. And, uh, you know, this requires all kinds of architectural changes and all the big companies are talking about how the, they are remodeling the offices, you know, so that's a business that's doing really well. And, Actually, that's true. I just had dinner the other night with an architect, and he said he's as busy as he's ever been. Yeah. And everybody he knows is as busy as they've ever yeah. been. So that's a very good point. Yeah, my neighbor is an architect at the same thing. So, uh, uh, you know, the, there's a contract. The contractors are incredibly busy right now. I mean, you can't even get them. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity in this whole thing. It's not just housing construction. I mean, it's, it's all right. the other things that, that that's going on, you know. And housing construction obviously is, is a big one, but on the, the, the office remodeling and, and those kinds of things is just taking place on a large scale. Now, if we get to the point where we uh, uh, redevelop office buildings into residential buildings, and that would be years, you know, because you get you got to change the zoning and the residential, the, the permitting, and that takes a long time in most in most places. And, but once that takes place, um, and there'll be a lot of work going on in that respect too. Yeah. It's really interesting. We've covered a lot of ground and we could cover a lot more, but is there anything that you want to bring up that we should, you know, that you want the viewers to be aware of that we haven't talked about today? Well, inflation is always the big thing, you know, and I, I cover that on my site pretty extensively. So wolfstreet.com, uh, there's no, no paywall. Anybody can get there. Um, inflation, I think is going to be, uh, the big thing we're we're uh, we're having to deal with, and how the Fed reacts to it, and how markets react to it, and um, you know what it will change, and um, so that's yeah. You know, people say yeah, it's not important, it's not going to happen, but it's happening right now, and and so I, I think people need to uh, need to constantly look at that. Uh, I would agree with that, since actually it's been happening since the day we were each one of us was born that inflation started eroding our purchasing power and wealth. We didn't even realize it. And the only difference between inflation and hyperinflation is the speed of the inflation. At the end of the day, you do end up losing if you are not prepared. And that's a lot of what we talk about. Well, this has been great, Wolf. Thank you so much. All of the links to his site, If you, if you, I'm sure that our viewers have already been on your sites, listening to your podcast. If not, you have the links, go there. You know, Wolf is one of my very favorite people to listen to because he's, as you now know, if you if this is the first time you've seen him, the man is brilliant. And definitely take advantage of, of his work because it's wonderful. And thank you thank so you for having much. Me. Oh, it's been my pleasure. We'll have to have you again, of course. <laughs> be great. So... Everybody out there, please be safe. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.